Effective nuclear charge, or ZEF, is one of the chemistry concepts that I love teaching because it has far-reaching implications. Having a deep understanding of effective nuclear charge will allow students to reason through lots of different problems no matter what the unit is. So you might say that this concept has a lot of bang for its buck. In today's video, we're going to break down how effective nuclear charge works, and we'll talk about some of the applications. Thanks for joining me. Make sure to get focused and remove all distractions, and let's get ready to learn. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Neil's not-so-boring world of chemistry. Let's go into the lab and take a deep look. Before we go any further, let's take a moment to explain the name effective nuclear charge and this curious symbol that we use to represent the concept. Now when it comes to the symbol, this Z is often used in chemistry context to represent the atomic number, which you know is the number of protons found in the nucleus of an atom. So we have the atomic number, and then the EFF is an abbreviation for effective. So basically, effective nuclear charge is the following. It's the number of protons in the nucleus that actually have an effect on the rest of the atom. Well, the rest of the atom are the electrons. So in this concept, we're going to be thinking about how many of the protons in the nucleus actually affect the electrons surrounding the nucleus in an atom. Okay, but let's look at a specific example. We're going to dive into a lithium atom's nucleus and electron configuration to better grasp this idea. So when we look up lithium on the periodic table, we see that it has an atomic number of 3. So remember, this Z is the symbol we use to represent that. And so in my nucleus of a lithium atom, I have 1, 2, 3 protons, and of course there's some neutrons in there as well. Now, in order for an atom to be neutral, it has to have the same number of electrons as protons, right? So beneath this lithium nucleus, I've written out lithium's electron configuration. 1s2, 2s1. And that gives us a total of three electrons. Now, based on this configuration, we can assume that two of the electrons in the 1s sublevel are going to be a bit closer to the nucleus and the final electron, what we call the valence electron, is going to be a bit further away in the second energy level. So I have a question for you, kind of abstract. If you're an electron in a lithium atom, what do you feel? Well, it's actually not that complicated. You see, electrons being charged particles can pretty much feel one of two things. They can either feel repulsion from other particles with the same charge, or they can feel attraction or pulling to particles with the opposite charge. So let's start with the repulsion first. If I'm this electron right here, there are some particles around me that have the same charge as I do. So I'm going to feel pushed away from that electron there, and I'm also going to feel pushed away from this electron over there. And all of these electrons are experiencing some repulsion from the neighboring electrons, right? But maybe more importantly, if I'm an electron in this atom, I'm going to feel pulled on by things with an opposite charge. So these three protons in the nucleus are actually pulling on the electrons. And technically, the electrons are pulling on the protons as well. And of course, this is what keeps these particles together in this unit that we call an atom. So if you're one of these electrons, how many protons do you feel pulling on you? Well, if you answered three, you're right, but you're also wrong. If I'm one of these inner electrons in the first energy level, I feel all three protons pulling on me. So this electron here feels the pull of three protons, and this electron here feels the full pull of three protons. But something interesting happens when we look at electrons that are a little bit further away. And this is where effective nuclear charge comes into play. You see, this electron way out here, the valence electron, 
doesn't feel all three of the protons pulling on it. Some of that pull from the nucleus is blocked or shielded by the inner electrons. So actually, for every inner electron there is between the valence electron and the nucleus, that's going to sort of cancel out the pull of one of the protons. So you can think of it as this electron canceling out the pull of this proton, and this electron canceling out the pull of that proton. And that only leaves one proton that isn't being blocked. So this electron, this outermost valence electron, actually only knows of one proton in the nucleus. It's only being pulled on by one proton. So we would say that the effective nuclear charge, the amount of the nuclear charge that's actually having an effect on an outermost electron is positive one. Let's work through an example together. Now, clearly, when we're asked to find the effective nuclear charge, or ZEF, on a homework assignment or in the course of completing an exam, we're not going to have a model that we can refer to where all the protons, neutrons, and electrons are drawn like we saw in the last segment. But all we really need is a periodic table and this understanding. The effective nuclear charge can always be calculated as long as you know the atomic number or the full nuclear charge and from that, you're going to subtract the core electrons. OK, but let's take a look at an element and figure this out together. So I'm going to focus on phosphorus. OK, now phosphorus, according to the periodic table, has an atomic number of 15. But I also need to know how many core electrons it has. Remember, those are the electrons that are going to be shielding or blocking some of that nuclear pull. Now, the periodic table only tells me the number of protons. But I know that phosphorus should also have 15 electrons. But how many of them are core electrons? I like to use electron configurations to figure this out. So phosphorus has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and 3p3. So here we can see all of the electrons arranged by their energy level. Now remember, the outermost electrons, the valence electrons, those are not core electrons. So these are the electrons in my valence level, or the outermost level of the configuration. So that means everything else is a core electron. So these are core electrons. And these two electrons are core electrons. And so are these six. So in total, I have 2, 4, plus 6 equals 10 core electrons. So my effective nuclear charge for phosphorus is 15 minus 10, which equals 5. The zeph of phosphorus is 5. After completing many problems on effective nuclear charge, one notices that a pattern emerges. It turns out that the zeph or effective nuclear charge for any element tends to be approximately equal to its number of valence electrons. So this is a nice shortcut or quick way to get an answer to a question asking you what the zeph of a particular element is. So we can take our periodic table, and as you can see here, I've labeled in red across the top the number of valence electrons for the major groups. And if I was asked, for example, what the effective nuclear charge of a calcium atom is, instead of looking at the atomic number, writing out the electron configuration, and subtracting the core electrons from the number of protons, I could simply note that calcium has two valence electrons, which means those electrons will feel the pull of two of the protons in the nucleus. Calcium's effective nuclear charge is positive 2. So here's a quick summary of the major ideas we covered, and then let's do a practice problem together. Effective nuclear charge is a way of describing the pull that an element's valence electrons feel based on the nucleus. This idea is explained by considering the fact that core electrons have a shielding effect. 
because they're situated in between the nucleus and the valence electrons, they're going to block some of the pull that should be felt from those protons in the nucleus. Now, what can you do with the ZEF once you figure out what it is? Well, in other lessons that I'll be posting, we'll get into how ZEF dictates the radius of atoms. And it also allows us to consider why it is that certain elements pull more weakly or strongly on the valence electrons of other atoms. And this is very relevant to chemical bonding. In order to calculate ZEF, you really just need to know two things. First, look up the atomic number of the element in question. This is just the number of protons and it's found on the periodic table. Next, you're gonna to need to figure out how many core electrons that element has. Now remember, the core electrons are all the electrons that are not valence electrons. Once you have these two numbers, you subtract the number of core electrons from the atomic number, and this will give you a positive value. This is the effective nuclear charge. Okay, let's try a practice question. Which of the following elements has an effective nuclear charge of seven? Think this question over and come up with an answer and then continue watching the video to see my solution. Okay, I hope you picked letter D, which is bromine. I start off by looking up bromine on my periodic table and I see that it has an atomic number of 35 or 35 protons. Now that means it should also have 35 electrons in total. But because bromine is a halogen, I know that seven of those 35 electrons are valence electrons. So that leaves 28 core electrons. By subtracting 28 from 35, I find the ZEF or effective nuclear charge to be seven. Thank you so much for watching this video. And of course, I hope it was helpful. Please remember that you can stay updated on what's going on with the channel by following me on Instagram. And of course, if you have any questions or comments for me, please leave them below.